Emma and me, and welcome to the programme. First tonight, it was like something out of Titanic, a lifeboat crewman's description of a dramatic rescue off the Norfolk coast this morning. It's emerged today that only one of the three people rescued from the sea off Haysborough was wearing a life jacket. Rescuers say they're extremely lucky to be alive, as Malcolm Robertson reports. For the crew of Case a Lifeboat, this was the most dramatic rescue they'd ever been involved in. South. Plucking two men and a teenage boy from the sea after their 36-foot boat had capsized in stormy conditions off the Norfolk coast this morning. Apparently, they'd been on a diving trip. Having been brought ashore at Galston, the survivors were treated in an ambulance before being transferred to the nearby James Paget Hospital, where they were released this afternoon. Apart from shock and swallowing quite a bit of seawater, they were none the worse for their ordeal. But they know just how fortunate they were to survive. This is just like something you saw off the Titanic. The guy who put the Mayday out went down in, in the cabin and the boat turned over with him in it. And luckily, he just saw a light, he said, and he swam towards the light and somehow he got out of the wheelhouse. And the boat went down like a lead. The Viking, a converted fishing boat, left harbour at 11 o'clock yesterday. At 8.21 this morning, Yarmouth Coast Guards received a call. The vessel had lost power 12 miles off the coast at Haysborough. Lifeboats from Haysborough and Caister set out in force four winds and rough seas. By this time, another boat had called the Coast Guards to report the Viking was sinking. Caister lifeboat was first on the scene at 12 minutes past nine. The crew pulled two men and a 14-year-old boy from the water. A dog tethered to the deck could not be saved. At 9.40, the lifeboat reached harbour at Gorston, where an ambulance was waiting. I spoke to two of them while they were at hospital and they were very reluctant to answer any questions about what they were doing at sea and whether they were sufficiently well prepared for the very rough conditions with just one of the three wearing a life jacket. Jason Delph was still wearing the shirt and tie he'd put on to serve breakfast at a Yarmouth hotel when he got the emergency call. When we got there there's a lot of debris in the water, boys floating about, boxers floating about in the water and then of course we saw the three heads. The um, lad had a life jacket on and the, um, I think it was his stepfather, was clinging onto him and a fishing box. Um, and the uh, diver was hanging onto his dive gear, basically. As the sea conditions eased and the case to crew were able to return to their home base a few miles along the coast, Coast Guards were warning that this incident should be a lesson to others. In the UK, we're fortunate in that it, anyone can go to sea in any vessel, but that um, brings with it its own responsibilities. Um, and from the MCA point of view, we would always recommend that people go to, go to sea having had some training and with the appropriate equipment on board and also before they go to sea, take heed of weather forecasts. With the drama over, Jason Delph was able to go back to the day job at the Burlington Hotel. Quite a contrast from what he'd been involved in earlier. Next, the devoted elderly couple thought to have frozen to death during the coldest week of the winter. Today, a serious case review decided that, in fact, Jean and Derek Randall died of natural causes and attached no blame to the authorities and charities involved in their case. Well, Martin Stew uh, joins us now from Northampton. Martin. Well, yes, seven years after the body of Jean and Derek uh, Randall were found in this house, this report shows not only did the authorities do nothing wrong, but Mr. Randall turned down the help they offered him. Uh, now, this report was put together by representatives from the NHS, uh, from the social services, from Age Concern, and from Northampton General Hospital, after the story hit the national papers, uh, with some claiming the couple froze to death. What the report shows is they actually died of natural causes, and there were sufficient heating, uh, there was sufficient heating in the house. But even so, could more have been done even after the couple turned down the offer of help? A tragic case, but not one of neglect. Derek and Jean Randall died because they were ill and refused help to make their last few days more comfortable. Back in January, neighbours voiced concerns the couple had been ignored by social services and left in freezing conditions. I feel frustrated. I feel annoyed because I tried so hard. I phoned everybody up trying to get some help and I said, you don't have... All, I said, all I'm asking you to do is come up and look at them. Mm. You come to the door, open the door, you'd see the condition the place was in and the state there it was in. The findings of today's serious case review show that help was offered but ignored. 
offers of care were made in a consistent way to Mr Randall and Mrs Randall and they declined that care when it was explained to them the options which were available. And I think that's really all that we can go on. In January 2008, Derek Randall became Jean's full-time carer after she returned from hospital. On the 8th of December last year, he called for a doctor as her heart condition was worsening. Two weeks later, Derek received advice from Age Concern on how to move his wife into a residential home, but he turned down offers for home help or respite care. A fortnight later, the couple were found dead in their house. The coroner ruled both died of natural causes, Jean of a heart attack and Derek of pneumonia. Neighbours told me Derek was a doting husband. They were a very loving couple, really. You know, he looked after his wife well. And from what I, I can remember, she, she's been poorly, actually, since I've known her, really. She's had one, one or two problems. There was no doubting his devotion to her care, but was he physically capable of delivering it? Jean and Derek Randall's death highlights once again the issue of just when, if ever, the social services should intervene. The case has many similarities to that of Stephanie Wolfe and her disabled daughter Sam, whose bodies were found at their house in Wheat Hampstead in Hertfordshire a month ago. Stephanie Wolfe had for years refused the help of social services. It is difficult, and of course in this case there's nothing that anybody could have done to actually uh, uh, have supported the Randalls because they were going to die of the conditions that they had. But I think there's some frustration because it would have been possible perhaps to make the, the last weeks of their lives more comfortable had they accepted care. But you have to absolutely respect an individual's choice to say, this is how I want to live my life. Choosing to accept that choice can be a tough call for a service set up to help. Martin Stew, Anglia News, Northampton. Well, earlier I spoke to Liam Condrum from Age Concern Northamptonshire and started by asking him whether more effort could have been made to help the Randalls. What the report shows is that um, all the agencies involved in the case acted reasonably and professionally uh, and that nothing that they might have done differently would have had an impact on the circumstances of the, the, Randall's, the Randall's deaths. But presumably it's down to the professional judgment of social workers and uh, professionals like yourselves to perhaps um, intervene even though those who need the help say they don't need any. Yes, one of the things that comes out of the report is that the Randalls made decisions about their own care, having the mental capacity to do that, uh, which weren't, in the view of professionals, always in their, in their best interests. Uh, but it's important that people have that capacity to, to make those decisions. So what is needed here? Is it a change in the law? Or, or do we need to look at the way we live as a society? Do neighbours and family members need to intervene earlier? Well, it, it isn't, there isn't a case for changing the law to take away people's right to make decisions about their own care, where they have the mental capacity to do that. But, but um, whether it's neighbours or professionals uh, or members of the family, uh, the only tools that are left open to people to try and change people's decisions are, on the one hand, persuasion, uh, and on the other, social pressure. Um, and it is, it is a debate for us all uh, about asking ourselves what sort of society do we want people to live in? Uh, what sort of society do we want to live in? Um, in, in circumstances where uh, communities um, know about their neighbours, it's absolutely right um, that, uh, that, that those neighbours, friends, community organisations like ours and statutory agencies all have a say in what we think is, is right for people. But, but ultimately we do have to leave decisions that people make up to themselves. Liam Condren from Age Concern, thanks for joining us. A lottery